morning, friends. We are on Chapter 5, Invasion. The slender hands of the clock on the stair wall pointed to 9.25 as we left the dining room that night. That in itself was unusual in our orderly lives. Father was 80 years old now, and promptly at 8.45 each evening, an hour sooner than formerly, he would open the Bible, the signal for prayers, read one chapter, ask God's blessing on us through the night, and by 9.15 be climbing the stairs to his bedroom. Tonight, however... The Prime Minister was to address the nation at 9.30. One question ached through all of Holland like a long-held breath. Would there be war? We circled up the steps to Tante John's rooms, and Father went to warm up the big table radio. We did not so often spend the evenings up here listening to music now. England, France, and Germany were at war. Their stations carried mostly war reports or code messages, and many frequencies were jammed. Even Dutch stations carried mostly war news, and that we could hear just as well on the small portable radio. We kept an owl in the dining room, a gift from Pickwick the Christmas before. This, though, was to be a major broadcast. Somehow we all felt it merited the large old set with its elaborate speaker. We sat now waiting for 9.30, tense and upright in the high-backed wooden chairs, avoiding as if by a kind of premonition the cushioned and comfortable seats. Then the Prime Minister's voice was speaking to us, Sonorous and soothing, there would be no war. He had had assurances from high sources on both sides. Holland's neutrality would be respected. It would be the great war all over again. There was nothing to fear. Dutchmen were urged to remain calm and to... The voice stopped. Betsy and I looked up, astonished. Father had snapped off the set, and in his, in his blue eyes was a fire we had never seen before. It is wrong to give people hope when there is no hope, he said. It is wrong to base faith upon wishes. There will be war. The Germans will attack and we will fall. He stamped on his cigar stub in the a he stamped he stamped on his cigar stub in the ashtray beside the radio, and with it it seemed the anger too, but his voice grew gentle again. Oh my dears, I am sorry for all Dutchmen now who do not know the power of God, for we will be beaten, but he will not. He kissed us both good night, and in a moment we heard the steps of an old man climbing the stairs to bed. Betsy and I sat rooted to our chairs. Father so skilled at finding good in every situation, so slow to believe evil. If father saw war and defeat, then there was no other possibility at all. I sat bolt upright in my bed. What was that? There, there it was again. A brilliant flash followed a second later by an explosion that shook the bed. I scrambled over the covers to the window and leaned out. The patch of sky above the chimney tops glowed orange-red. I felt for my bathrobe and thrust my arms through the sleeves as I whirled down the stairs. At father's room, I pressed my ear against the door. Between bomb bursts, I heard the regular rhythm of his breathing. I dived down a few more steps and into Tante John's rooms. Betsy had long since moved into Tante John's little sleeping cubicle, where she would be near the kitchen and the doorbell. She was sitting straight. She was sitting up in bed. I groped toward her in the darkness, and we threw our arms around each other. Together, we said it aloud. War. It was five hours after the Prime Minister's speech. How long we clung together listening, I do not know. The bombing seemed mostly to be coming from the direction of the airport. At last we tiptoed uncertainly out of Tante John's front room. The glowing sky lit the room with strange brilliance. The chairs, the mahogany bookcase, the old upright piano, all pulsed with an eerie light. Betsy and I knelt down by the piano bench. For what seemed hours we prayed for our country, for the dead and the injured tonight. For the queen and then incredibly betsy began to pray for the germans up there in the plains caught in the fist of the giant evil loose in germany i looked at my sister kneeling beside me in the light of burning holland oh lord i whispered listen to betsy not me because i cannot pray for those men at all and this and it was then that i had the dream it couldn't have been a real dream because i was not asleep but a scene was suddenly and unreasonably in my mind i saw the groat marked half a block away, as clearly as though I was standing there, saw the town hall in St. Bavos and the fish market, with its stair-stepped facade. Then, as I watched a kind of odd old farm wagon, old-fashioned and out of place in the middle of a city, came lumbering across the square, pulled by four enormous black horses. To my surprise, I saw that I myself was sitting in the wagon, and father, too, and Betsy. There were many others, some strangers, some friends. I recognized Pickwick and Toos. Willem and young Peter. Altogether, we were slowly being drawn across the square behind those horses. I couldn't get off the wagon. That was the terrible thing. It was taking us away, far away, I felt, but we didn't want to go. Betsy, I cried, jumping up. 
pressing my hands to my eyes. Betsy, I've had such an awful dream. I felt her arm around my shoulder. We'll go down to the kitchen where the light won't show, and we'll make a pot of coffee. The booming of the bombs was less frequent and farther away, as Betsy put on the water. Closer by was the wail of fire alarms and the beep of the hose trucks. Over coffee, standing at the stove, I told Betsy what I had seen. Am I imagining those things because I'm frightened? But it wasn't like that. It was real. Oh, Betsy, what was it a kind of vision? Betsy's fingers traced a pattern on the wooden sink, worn smooth by generations of ten booms. I don't know, she said softly, but if God has shown us bad times ahead, it's enough for he, me that he knows about them. That's why he sometimes shows us things, you know, to tell us that this too is in his hands. For five days, Holland held out against the invader. We kept the shop open, not because anyone was interested in watches, but because people wanted to see father. Some wanted him to pray for husbands and sons stationed at the border of the country. Others, it seemed to me, came just to see him sitting there behind his workbench, as he had for sixty years, and to hear in, and to hear in the ticking clocks a world of order and reason. I never opened my workbench at all, but joined Betsy, making coffee and carrying it down. We brought down the portable radio, too, and we set it up on the display case. Radio was Harlem's eyes and ears, and very pulse rate. For after that first night, although we often heard planes overhead, the bombing never came so close again. The first morning over the radio came instructions that ground floor windows must be taped. Up and down the Bartle Jorestrat, shop owners were out on the sidewalk. There was an unaccustomed neighborhood feel as, as advice, rolls of adhesive, and tales of the night's terror passed from door to door. One store, over, one store owner, an outspoken anti-Semite, was helping wheel the Jewish furrier, put up boards where a pane of glass had shaken loose. The optician next door to us, a silent, withdrawn individual, came over and taped the top of our display window where Betsy and I could not reach. A few nights later, the radio carried the news we dreaded. The Queen had left. I had not cried the night of, of the invasion, but I cried now, for our country was lost. In the morning, the radio announced tanks advancing over the border, and suddenly all of Harlem was in the streets. Even Father, whose daily stroll was as predictable as his own clock chimes, broke his routine to go walking at the unheard of, uh, unheard of hour of 10 a.m. It was as though we wanted to face what was coming together, the whole city united, as though each would draw strength from each other, from each other Hollander. And so the three of us walked, jostled by the crowd, over the bridge in the sparn, all the way to the great wild cherry tree whose blossoms each spring formed such a white glory that it was, the it was called the Bride of Harlem. A few faded petals clung now to the new-leafed branches, but most of the bride's flowers had fallen, forming a wilted carpet beneath us. A window down the street flew open. We've surrendered! The procession in the street stopped short. Each told his neighbor that we had what we had all heard for ourselves. A boy of maybe fifteen turned to us with tears rolling down his cheeks. I would have fought. I wouldn't have ever have given up. Father stooped down to pick up a small, bruised petal from the brick pavement. Tenderly, he had cerned it into his buttonhole. That is good, my son, he told the youngster, for Holland's battle has just begun. But during the first months of occupation, life was not so very unbearable. The hardest thing to get used to was the German uniform everywhere. German trucks and tanks in the street, German spoken in the shops. Soldiers frequently visited our store, for they were getting good wages, and watches were among the first things they bought. Toward us they took a superior tone, as though we were not quite bright children. But among themselves, as I listened to them excitedly discussing their purchases, they seemed like young men anywhere off on a holiday. Most of them selected women's watches for mothers and sweethearts back home. Indeed, the shop never made so much money as during that first war of, year of the war. With no new shipments coming in, people people bought up everything we had in stock, even the Winkle Doctors, the Shop Daughters merchandise that had lain around so long it seemed part of the furniture. We even sold the green marble mantel clock with the twin brass cupids. The curfew, too, at first, was no hardship for us, since it was originally set at 10 p.m., long after we had our... In, we, long after we were indoors in any case. What we did object to were the identity cards each citizen was issued. These small folders containing photograph and fingerprints had to be produced on demand. A soldier or a policeman, the Harlem police, were now under the direct control of the German commandant. 
might stop a citizen at any time and ask to see his card. It had to be carried in a pouch about the neck. We were issued ration cards, too, but at least that first year, the coupons represented food and merchandise actually available in the stores. Each week, the newspapers announced what the current coupons could be exchanged for. That was another thing it was hard to adjust to, newspapers that no longer carried news. Long, glowing reports of the successes of, Germ of the German army on its various fronts, eulogies of German leaders, denunciations of traitors and saboteurs, appeals for the unity of the Nordic peoples, but not news that we could trust. So we, and so we depended again on the radio. Early in the occupation, Harlemers were ordered to turn in all private sets. Realizing it would look strange if our household produced none at all, we decided to turn in the portable and hide the larger, more pow powerful instrument in one of the many hollow spaces beneath the twisting staircase. Both suggestions were Peter's. He was sixteen at the time of the invasion and shared with our other Dutch teenagers the restless energy of anger and impotence. Peter installed the table radio beneath a curve in the stairs just above Father's room and expertly replaced the old boards, while I carried the smaller one down to the big room and room in Driesman department store where the radio collection was being made. The army clerk looked at me across the counter. Is this the only radio you own? Yes. He consulted a list in front of him. Ten Boom, Casper, Ten Boom, Elizabeth, at the same address. Do either of them own a radio? I had known from childhood that the earth opened and the heavens rained fire upon liars, but I met his gaze. No. Only as I walked out of the building did I begin to tremble. Not because of the, for the first time in my life I had told a conscious lie, but because it had been so dreadfully easy. But we had saved our radio. Every night, Betsy and I would remove the stair, stair tread and crouch over the radio, the vol volume barely audible, while the other one thumped the piano in Tante John's room as hard as she could to hear the news from England. And at first, the news over the radio and the news in our captive press was much the same. The German offensive was everywhere vic victorious. Month after month, the free Dutch broadcast could only urge us to wait, to have courage, to believe in the counter-offensive, offensive which must surely some day be mounted. The Germans had repaired the bomb damage to the airport and were using it now as a base for air raids against England. Night after night, we lay in bed listening to the growl of engines heading west. Occasionally, English planes retaliated and then the German fighters might intercept them right over Harlem. One night, I tossed for an hour while dogfights raged overhead, streaking my patch of sky with fire. At last, I heard Betsy stirring in the kitchen and ran down to join her. She was making tea. She brought it into the dining room where we had covered the windows with heavy black paper and set out the best cups. Somewhere in the night there was an explosion. The dishes in the cupboard rattled. For an hour we sipped our tea and talked, until the sound of planes died away and the sky was silent. I said good night to Betsy at the door to Tante John's rooms and groped my way up the dark stairs to my own. The fiery light was gone from the sky. I felt for my bed. There was the pillow. Then in the darkness my hand closed over something hard, sharp too. I felt blood trickle along a finger. It was a jagged piece of metal ten inches long. Betsy! I raced down the stairs with the shrapnel shard in my hand. We went back to the dining room and stared at it in the light while Betsy bandaged my hand. On your pillow, she kept saying. Betsy, if I hadn't heard you in the kitchen. And Betsy put a finger on my mouth. Don't say it, Corey. There are no ifs in God's world. And no places where there that are safer than other places. The center of his will is our only safety. Oh, Corey, let us pray that we may always know it. The true horror of occupation came over us only slowly. During the first year of German rule, there were only minor attacks on Jews in Holland. A rock through a window of a Jewish-owned store. An ugly word scrawled on the wall of a synagogue. It was as though they were trying us, testing the temper of the country. How many Dutchmen could go, would go along with them? And the answer to our shame was many. The National Socialist Bond, the quisling organization of Holland, grew larger and bolder with each month of occupation. Some joined the NSB simply for the benefits, more food, more clothing coupons, the best jobs and housing. And others became NSBers out of conviction. Nazism was a disease to which the Dutch, too, were susceptible, and those with an anti-Semitic bias fell sick of it at first. Fell sick of it first. On our daily walk, Father and I saw the symptoms spread. A sign in a shop window, Jews will not be served. At the entrance to a public park, no Jews. 
on the door of the library, in front of restaurants, theaters, even the concert hall whose alley we knew so much about, whose alley we knew so much better than its seats. A synagogue burned down and the fire trucks came, but only to keep the flames from spreading to the buildings on either side. One noon, as Father and I followed our familiar route, the sidewalks were bright with yellow stars sewn to coats and jacket fronts. Men, women, and children wore the six-pointed star with the word Jude, Jew, in the center. We were surprised, as we walked, at how many of the people we had passed each day were Jews. The many who read, the man who read the world shipping news in the Groat Mart wore a star in his neatly pressed business suit. So did the bulldog, his jowly face more deeply lined than ever his voice as he fussed at his dogs sharp with strain. Worst were the disappearances, a watch repaired and ready, hanging on its hook in the back of the shop month after month, a house in Nolly's block mysteriously a house in Nolly's block mysteriously deserted, the grass growing in the rose garden. One day Mr Conn's shop up the street did not open. Father knocked Father knocked on his door as we passed that noon to see if someone were ill, but there was no answer. The shop remained shuttered, the windows above, dark and silent for several weeks. Then, although sh the shop stayed closed, an NSB family moved into the apartment above. We never knew whether these people had been spirited away by the Gestapo or gone into hiding before this could happen. Certainly public arrests, with no attempt con to conceal what was happening, were becoming more frequent. One day, as Father and I were returning from our walk, we found the groat marked, cordoned off by a double ring of police and soldiers. A truck was parked in front of the fish mart. Into the back were climbing men, women, and children, all wearing the yellow star. There was no reason we could see. There was no reason we could see why this particular place at this particular time had been chosen. Father, those poor people! I cried. The police line opened. The truck moved through. We watched till it turned the corner. Those poor people! Father echoed. But to my surprise, I saw that he was looking at the soldiers now, forming into ranks. To march away, I pity the poor Germans, Corey. They have touched the apple of God's eye. We talked often, Father, Betsy, and I, about what we could do if a chance should come to help some of our Jewish friends. We knew that Willem had found hiding places at the beginning of the occupation for the German Jews who had been living in his house. Lately, he had also moved some of the younger Dutch Jews away from the nursing home. Not my old people, he would say. Surely they will not touch my old people. Willem had addresses. He knew of farms in rural, rural, rural areas where there were few occupying troops. Willem would be the one to ask. It was a drizzly November morning in 1941, a year and a half after the invasion, as I stepped outside to fold back the shutters, that I saw a group of four German soldiers coming down the Bartle Jorstraat. They were wearing combat helmets low over their ears, rifles strapped to their shoulders. I shrank back into the doorway and watched. They were checking shop numbers as they walked. At wheel, Wheels fur, Furriers, directly across the street, the group stopped. One of the soldiers unstrapped his gun, and with the butt banged on the door. He was drawing it back with it for another blow when the door opened and all four pushed inside. I dashed back through our shop and up to the dining room where Betsy was setting out three places. Betsy, hurry! Something awful is happening at Wheels! We reached the front door again in time to see Mr. Wheel backing out of his shop, the muzzle of a gun pressed against his stomach. When he had prodded Mr. Wheel a short way down the sidewalk, the soldier went back to, into the store and slammed the door, not in arrest then. Inside we could hear glass breaking. Soldiers began carrying out armloads of furs. A crowd was gathering in spite of the early morning hour. Mr. Wheel had not moved from the spot on the sidewalk where the soldier had left him. A window over his head opened and a small shower of clothes rained down on him, pajamas, shirts, underwear. Slowly, mechanically, the old furrier stopped and began to gather up his clothing. Betsy and I ran across the street to help him. Your wife, Betsy whispered urgently. Where is, where is Mrs. Wheel? The, the man only blinked at her. You must come inside, I said, snatching socks and handkerchiefs from the sidewalk. Quick, with us. And we propelled the bewildered old man across to the beji. Father was in the dining room, and when we reached it and greeted Mr. Wheel without the slightest sign of surprise, his natural manner seemed to relax the furrier a bit. His wife, he said, was visiting, visiting a sister in Amsterdam. We must find a, tel a telephone and warn her not to come home, Betsy said. Like most private telephone, 
Like most private telephones, ours had been disconnected early in the occupation. There were public phones at several places in the city, but of course messages went to a public reception center at the other end. Was it right to connect a family in Amsterdam with the trouble here? But if Mr. Wheel could not come home, if Mrs. Wheel could not come home, where was she to go? Where were the wheels to live? Certainly not with the sister, where they could so easily be traced. Father and Betsy and I exchanged glances. Almost with a single breath, we said, Willem. Again, it was not, not the kind of matter that could be relayed through the public phone system. Someone had to go, and I was the obvious choice. Dutch trains were dirty and overcrowded under the occupation. The trip that should have taken under an hour took nearly three. Willem was not there when I finally reached the big nursing home just after noon. Bettini and her twenty and her twenty-two year old son Kick were. I told them what had happened on the Bar Bartle Jorestraat and gave them the Amsterdam address. Tell Mr. Wheel to be ready as soon as it's dark, Kick said. But it was nearly nine PM, the new curfew hour before Kick rapped at the alley door. Tucking Mr. Wheel's clothing bundle beneath his arm, he led the man away into the night. It was more than two weeks before I saw Kick again to ask him what had happened. He smiled at me, the broad, slow smile I had loved since he was a child. If you're going to work with the underground, Tante Cory, you must learn not to ask questions. That was all we ever learned of the wheels. But Kick's words went round and round in my head. The underground. If you're going to work with the underground. Was Kick working with this secret illegal group? Was Willem? We knew, of course, that there was an underground in Holland, or suspected it. Most cases of sabotage were not reported in our controlled press, but rumors abounded. A factory had been blown up, a train carrying political prisoners had been stopped, and seven or seventeen or seventy had made it away. The rumors tended to get more spectacular with each repetition, but always they featured things we believed were wrong in the sight of God, stealing, lying, murder. Was this what God wanted in times like these? How should a Christian act when evil was in power? It was about a month after the raid on the fur shop that Father and I, on our usual walk, saw something so very unusual that we both stopped in mid-stride. Walking toward us along the sidewalk, as so many hundreds of times before, came the bulldog with his rolling, short-legged gait. The bright yellow star had now ceased to look extraordinary, so what? And then I knew what was wrong. The dogs, the dogs were not with him. He passed without seeming to see us. With one accord, Father and I turned around and walked after him. He turned a number of corners while we grew more and more embarrassed at following him without any real excuse. Although Father and he had tipped their hats to each other for years, we had never spoken and did not even know his name. At last the man stopped in front of a small second-hand shop, took out a ring of keys, and let himself in. We looked through the window at the cluttered interior. Only a glance showed us that this was more than the usual hodgepodge of bric-a-brac bric and hollow-seated chairs. Someone who loved these beautiful things had chosen everything here. We must bring Betsy, I said. A little bell over the door jingled as we stepped in, astonishing to see the bulldog hatless and indoors, unlocking a cash drawer at the rear of the store. Permit an introduction, sir, father began. I am Casper Ten Boom, and this is my daughter Cornelia. The bulldog shook hands and began, and again I noticed the deep creases in the sagging cheeks. Harry De Vries, he said. Mr. De Vries, We've so often admired your er, affection for your bulldogs. I hope they are well. The squat little man stared from one of us to the other. Slowly, the heavy-rimmed eyes filled with tears. Are they well, he repeated. I believe they are, are well. I hope that they are well. They are dead. Dead, we said together. I put the medicine in their bowl with my own hands, and I petted them to sleep. My babies, my little ones. If you could only have seen the meat. I waited, you know, till we had enough coupons for meat. They used to have meat all the time. We stared at him dumbly. Was it, I ventured at last, was it because of the rationing? With a gesture of his hands, the little man invited us into a small room in back of the shop and gave us chairs. Miss Tin Boom, I am a Jew. Who knows when they will come and take me away? My wife, too, although she is a Gentile, is in danger because of her marriage. The bulldog raised his chin so high his jowls stretched taut. It is not for ourselves we mind. We are Christians, Cato and I. When we die, we will see Jesus, and this is all that matters. But I said to Cato, what about the dogs? If we are taken away, who will feed them? Who will remember their water and their walk? We th they will wait, and we will not come, and they will not understand. No, this is... This way my mind is at ease. My dear friend, Father grasped the, grasped the bulldog's hand in both of his. 
Now that these dear companions may no longer walk with you, will you not will you not do my daughter and me the great honor of accompanying us? But this the bulldog would not do. It would put you in danger, he kept saying. He did, however, accept an invitation to come to visit us. After dark, after dark, he said. And so one evening the following week, Mr. de Vries came to the alley door of the Beji, bringing his sweet, shy wife, Cato. And soon she and Harry were almost nightly visitors in Tante John's front room. The bulldog's chief delight at the Beji, after talking with father, were the tomes of Jewish theology now housed in Tante John's big mahogany case, for he had become a Christian some forty years earlier, without ceasing in the least to be a loyal Jew, a completed Jew, he would tell us smilingly, a follower of the one perfect Jew. The books belonged to the rabbi of Harlem. He had brought them to father more than a year before, just in case I should not be able to care for them uh, indefinitely. He had waved a bit apologetically at the procession of small boys behind him, each staggering under the weight of several huge volumes. My little hobby, book collecting. And yet, old friend, books do not age as you and I do. They will speak still when we are gone, to generations we will never see. Yes, the books must survive. The rabbi had been one of the first to vanish from Harlem. How often it is a small, almost unconscious event that marks a turning point. As arrest of Jews in the streets became more frequent, I had begun picking up and delivering work for our Jewish customers, myself, so that they would not have to venture into the center of town. And so one evening in early spring of 1942, I was in the home of a doctor and his wife. They were a very old Dutch family. The portraits on the walls could have been a textbook of Holland's history. The Hemstrass and I were talking about the things that were dis 